is a voice that speaks There is a voice that speaks to my fearful heart It tells me you're not far It's in the words I read In the words I read I see the red letters are Love pouring from your scars Speak to me, speak to me, speak to me Sorry, it's not exit only. You can walk in through the door. 
I know, it's just a stupid joke, but, but sometimes we walk through the wrong door uh, purposely, other times uh, by accident. Again, I don't have one of those stories, but I'm going to share one with you because my mom had this happen, and she's shared it before, so, so I, I know I have the, the, the rights to be able to go ahead and share it with all of you. Uh, she was traveling from Michigan to Arizona to visit us probably, I don't know, four years ago or so, somewhere in there. She's in her 80s. She has uh, problems with her blood sugar. So the levels are really high and then really low and they were spiking. They were all over the place. And so she's driving longer than she should have been driving. But she stops at a rest area and she goes in and kids, she's all messed up because of the blood sugar levels. But she didn't even pay attention. She just walks into the men's room, goes into one of the stalls. Comes out of the stalls. Now, these are my mom's words, okay? She's washing her hands, and she's looking at the, at the stall next to her, and she's thinking, those are freaky-looking shoes for a woman to wear. I don't know I don't know what the guy was wearing, but that, that's what she said. And then she washed her hands, and she's drying her hands over here, and the, and the hand dryer, and she said, she turned around, and there were two men standing at the sink, washing their hands, giving her the weirdest look you could ever get. So, the wrong door. She was embarrassed, she ran out. Well, she didn't run out, but she quickly got out of there, jumped in her car, took off. Guys, I think we've probably all done something very similar. And the reason I bring it up, because the message today, Jesus is really talking about this concept of doors. More specifically, open doors and closed doors. And we find that in our text, which is Revelation chapter 3. If you guys will turn there now. We will start very, very quickly. Uh, we've got... A lot of ground to cover today. Uh, a lot of ground to get done. I want to get it done while we still have some daylight out there today. So Revelation 3, if you have your Bible like me, last book in the Bible. Can't be more simplistic than that. If you have your smartphones, open up your Bible apps to Revelation 3. What we're going to be looking at today is this uh, church in Philadelphia. Not Pennsylvania, uh, but Asia Minor, or Turkey it is today. But back in the day, in Asia Minor... Uh, this city, Philadelphia, was located about 30 miles southeast of Sardis, where we were last week. Okay, And it was very popular for several reasons. First and foremost, uh, it was famous for wine and hot springs. So, so if you're the kind of person that, that thinks that a relaxing day or relaxing at the end of the day involves a bottle of wine and a hot tub, that's where you wanted to be. That's essentially what that was. Uh, hot springs and wine, but also, listen, they, they, were, they were really the, the catalyst for uh, the spread of the Greek culture, the, the, the Greek language. It kind of grew up there, and they took it to uh, as far east as you could possibly go. In fact, the city was known as the gateway to the east because of that. But if there was one drawback to the city, I would have to say that uh, it was near a fault line, so it was built near a fault line, so you had earthquakes. Actually, they were very prominent, very very violent as well. Back in AD 17, there was an earthquake that went through, completely wiped out the city, almost completely destroyed Sardis, 30 miles away, and it took out 10 cities in the process. So, so it was no big, it was no, it was a big deal, I was going to say, it wasn't, uh, you know, something that you would just kind of, you know, brush to the side. If you're in the city and there's a tremor, <laughs> you didn't wait for it to get worse, you got out of the city as soon as possible. In fact, some of the people who, who lived there, uh, they would abandon their homes for a period of times, and they would just live outside of the city in tents in the surrounding areas because the earthquakes were so violent. So, so that's what's going on in the city. In the church itself there in Philadelphia, I would say there were some spiritual earthquakes that had been taking place. And this is letter number six. Uh, we're going through, if you haven't been here, we're going through uh, the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the churches. We're actually going through a year-long sermon series, Living in the Red, where we're looking at the red letter words of Jesus, the words of Jesus. The idea is not just to learn about Jesus, but to really get to know Him at the most deepest, intimate, personal level that we possibly can. And so, Jesus wrote these letters, I should say he spoke these letters and John wrote them, but they're his words, and that's why we're looking at them, and out of the seven, today is number six. So we're almost there, we got one to go next week, and this is the second out of, the, out of all seven letters, this is the second where there's no condemnation from Jesus. Uh, we know that, that we've already looked at six, five technically before this point, uh, I looked at five, four of them, uh, Jesus was condemning them. There was one in there where he did. That was the church in Smyrna. I remember there was uh, suffering and persecution that was taking place. So this is the second one, like I said last week, 
warm and fuzzy message today. And actually, the message today really is about comfort. It's really, really about strength and hope, uh, peacefulness. Remember, these letters weren't written to us, but they were written for us. And so as we get into the text, you're going to find some similarities with last week, specifically that the introduction that Jesus gives is very brief. Uh, remember how there's some that we can just really unpack for several minutes? We're not going to get that today. Again, a very brief introduction, but fitted to the church. Because every introduction that he gives is specifically fitted to the message for that particular church. And the one that he gives today is a very comforting introduction. It will give them hope. It will give them uh, the strength that they need. Courage to move forward. So on and so forth. So if you guys are ready, let's go ahead and open up. And let's take a look at what Jesus says. Chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Jesus says this. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes... These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Okay, so, so like I said, very brief, just cut and dry. He's holy and true. Guys, I don't think we need to unpack that. We, we probably don't need to spend ten minutes talking about Jesus, uh, holy and true. I think we get that for the most part. He's holy. He's true. Um, you move from there, though, uh, this guy who holds the key of David, then it gets, a, it gets a little goofy. You wonder what that is. It's actually a reference in twofold back to the Old Testament. Uh, the king would hold the keys. And so it was this symbol of power, of authority. Jesus is saying, I, I'm holding the keys. I have all power. I have all authority. The reference to David is just that he's in the lineage of David. He is the true Messiah. So in a nutshell, Jesus really at the deepest level is saying, hey guys, I got a message for you and it's coming from me. I'm holy and true. I hold keys. That means I have all power, all authority, and I am the one and only Messiah. So again, from what they've been going through, that is just comforting right, right from the get-go for them. And then he goes into that even more so and says, guys, listen, I'm the one who opens doors and nobody can close. And when I close a door, no one can open it. And again, I can't imagine anything more comforting, seriously, than, than to have that trust. Just to have that, that promise that Jesus will open a door when he does, no one can shut it. I, again, I don't think we need to take like 20 minutes to you know, talk about doors and, and what Jesus is getting at here. I think most of us, and if you know this, if you've heard this or said this, um, finish it with me. When God closes a door, he... Opens another. Yeah, exactly. So most of us have heard that. So we get it. We understand that there's going to be another door that's going to open. Maybe some of you have been praying for an open door. Now, let me say this. When you do see an open door, let me briefly help you to recognize whether it's from God or not. Uh, first and foremost, prayer. Pray about it. Pray about it. Pray through it. Uh, and more specifically, if it's an answer to prayer, chances are good. Uh, that is a door that, that God has opened in front of you, for sure. Uh, but we need some wisdom. We need some discernment. Uh, so make sure you have some wisdom with discernment. You get that from God's Word. Make sure that the door itself, which again, it's an opportunity, but when you say door, make sure that does line up with, with God's Word, with Scripture, with, with the message, with how we're supposed to live uh, in this world as Christians. Okay, For example, um, if you are at a bank and there's one teller and you know you can take this teller out and rob the bank, that is not giving you an open door to rob the bank, okay? So there has to be some wisdom and discernment in that. Um, get some godly counsel. Not someone who knows, you know they're going to give you the answer you want, but someone who you trust can give you some good godly counsel grounded in God's Word, okay? So just a couple simple ways. And listen, let me just say this. For some of you here today, the message might already be right there. For some of you, you coming in here and the message you just need to hear today is that Jesus opens the door and when he does, nobody closes it. That might be simply it for you. You might be like, all right, I'm going to go check out me, grab coffee and head out. Hopefully not, because there's more. But, but that might be the message for some of you here today. Maybe some of you have been praying for an open door. Just praying that, that God would open a door for you. And, and again, that could be work related. Uh, that could be health. Uh, that could be your finances, that could be relationships, it could be in so many ways if you've just been praying and praying that, that God will open a door for you and you find comfort and peace and strength and hope knowing that Jesus does open doors and when he does, no one shuts that door. Okay? And then Jesus continues on. 
kind of with the same thought as well. Verse 8, he says this, I know your deeds. We've already talked about that previously. He says this, See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Okay, I know your deeds. We get that, right? This is, this is our picture of, 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 our, of our high priest here in Revelation 3. But we've gone through this. In fact, if you want to remember what, if you want to see the sermon, you've got to go all the way back to January. Because that was the very first one, the trial sermon, the three views of Jesus from the book of Revelation. Because we see him. And we're going to see him as we go through this in several of those ways for sure. And this one is the high priest. He's got eyes like blazing fire. He sees everything. But not just externally. He sees inside. He sees the heart. He sees the motives. He understands us to, to the finest detail. And he says, I see your deeds. Now listen, if you're doing good, if you're a good boy, a good girl... Those are good comforting words, right? Ah, oh, he sees. Awesome. Great. And again, for some of you, that might simply be the message. You've been plugging away. You've been doing your best to stay faithful and stay committed and, and to be on track and walk as righteously as you can. And for you to hear him say, I see you. I see what's going on. I get it. I don't miss a beat. Maybe some of you, that's, that's just the message of hope this morning. Because he doesn't miss a thing. I see your deeds. Listen, he, 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 he says, I think this is, I don't know how to, I'm excited. I think this is the greatest thing he could say to a church. I've placed before you, church, I've placed before you an open door that no one can close. No one can shut. I, I, and goosebumps. I, I've, I've been going through this this entire week, practicing it, and trying, trying to get through the entire sermon, believe it or not, which didn't happen until yesterday. Huh. Yeah, he's been chewing in there, and I've been chewing in there, and there's been a lot going on this week, but, but just to have him say, can you imagine, if we he, hear right now, just say, go to a Christian church, I have placed before you a door, open door, that no one can close. I don't even know what that all is, but that sounds amazing to me. Amazing. Whatever that door would be, that's got the greatest comfort that this church can get, our church, and this church in Philadelphia. He's telling them, I know you have little strength. I think that kind of goes around the board for basically any church today. Uh, they can go from little strength to great strength. I don't know what's going on in that church in Philadelphia. Maybe there's just a small congregation. You know, they're doing their best to just keep on keeping on. Maybe they got a small building. The building doesn't really fit or work uh, for, you know, what they want to do. Maybe their budget is really small. They just don't have a whole lot to get out. Maybe, maybe congregation-wise, they just, they're just not filled with heavy hitters. You know, big influential people, doctors, lawyers, politicians, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe just in general, they just, they're just not doing a good job really impacting the city because of the city itself. I don't know, but I know that the odds are stacked against them to the point that Jesus says, I get it. I get it. You have little strength. But let me encourage you by saying that you've kept my word. Because the other churches we've seen have not. And you've not denied my name. And the other churches we've seen... I've done that. Right? Obviously not smeared them, but four out of the last five, sexual immorality, idol worship, false teaching. It's all there. They denied Jesus in just about every possible way they can. And remember now, these are churches. I think these are things that we forget. We're thinking, oh, well, just that city, a city of Sardis. Pfft, losers. And he's talking to the church. It's a letter to the church. So, so keep that in mind, guys. That it's in the church. And guess what? It wasn't just thousands of years ago. It's still in the church today. We still have problems that are addressed in those letters today. Like I said, I honestly believe Jesus chose those specific seven churches because they kind of fit the bill for the majority of churches that we find. I, I would say all churches. Because two particular churches, he just gives praise. He says, you're doing a phenomenal job. Here's my big thumbs up. Good job. Keep it up. Keep on moving. Yeah. They're faithful. Listen, God honors faith. We talked about this before too. He rewards faith. He demands faith. Hebrews 11.6 says it's impossible to please God without faith. So we have to have it. So, so he goes into this and he says, here's the deal, guys. I just want you to understand. I see everything. I, I see where you're at. You have little strength, but you're doing a phenomenal job staying faithful, staying committed. But listen, not everything was all good news. For example, starting in verse 9, we see that there were some problems as well. Verse 9, Jesus says this, 
I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, yikes, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Okay, synagogue of Satan. Uh, you definitely don't want to go to their small group study. I don't know what that's going to be like, but probably not super good. Uh, Jesus is saying, look, I get it. I, I, I see, I understand, uh, you're getting some persecution. There are some others out there who claim to be Jews, but they're really not. Jesus is just saying they're, they're liars. They're not true, uh, faithful, authentic Jews. Because listen, Jesus came first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The Jews rejected, now not all, but, but majority as a people, they rejected him. And so he says, if they were true, authentic Jews, they would have accepted me, they would have received me, they would have heard the message, believed I was sent by God, we wouldn't be having this talk right now. So they're liars. And they're picking on people. They're, whatever they're doing, they could just be slandered, could be cursing them. We don't know 100%. But he says, you know what? It's all good, because I got you back. I like that. He said, I got you back. There's going to be a day when I'm going to make them... Make them come right down to their knees and acknowledge that I love you. That's awesome. Listen, maybe for some of you, that's the message. Maybe for some of you today, you, you, you do the things, you know, those churchy things that we talk about. You fight the good fight. You run the race. You keep the faith. Again, churchy words and phrases, but we know what it means. We know that it comes down to being faithful and committed and following Christ and serving Him. Uh, and you're doing that. And in the midst of doing that, though, you're getting beat up a little bit in different places. Perhaps it's at home. I mean, it could be just as simply as at home. Maybe even your spouse. Maybe your spouse just isn't on board 100%. Now, I mean, it doesn't include everybody here, but think about the people that you work with. You may work with a, a very strong, committed Christian individual, and their spouse doesn't, doesn't agree, doesn't align with them. And you could be the one to help them in that. You can be the one to give them strength and encouragement by saying, look, here's the deal. There's going to be a day where Jesus is going to, he's going to right all the wrongs. Again, this goes to the, the one where Jesus is our conquering king. What does the future look like? I don't know. But the king is coming. And he's going to right every wrong. Maybe for some of you, it's just in the workplace in general. Maybe your boss. Maybe he's the one that maybe just picks on you, ridicules you curses you. Maybe there's just, there's just persecution on, on many different levels there because you're a Christian and he or she is not. And you continue to push and to press on. Guys, take comfort in knowing that it's not going to last forever. And also, Jesus has your back. I love that Paul says in Philippians 2, he says, listen, one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we always say, Amen. And we get excited about that. Uh, but let me let me share with you, there's, a, there's kind of a downside to that. I don't mean a downside, but, but a downer, right? A, a sad side. Here's, here's what I mean. We say it because I, and I bring this up because I read an article probably about three weeks ago from some preacher guy, internet, so you know it's totally true, right? Everything on the internet is true, right? Okay, so not so much. He, he's basically saying that, uh, that this verse says that every single person throughout the entirety of history will bow their knee, I agree, and will confess Jesus is Lord, I agree, but says that because of that moment that everybody will, will be in the same graces of, of God and there's no eternal separation and, and what have you. But I'm sorry, the Bible doesn't teach that. In reality, what's going to happen is there are going to be some with a broken heart who are going to bow their knee and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Not their Lord, but as Lord. And it's too late. It's too late. So, so when we say, oh, every day, we'll, you know, every, one day every knee will bow, every time we'll confess, we, we kind of get excited about that. But guys, think about those, think about family members who don't know Jesus yet. Think about your friends, or, or again, it could be spouse, parents, children don't know Jesus yet. We all, as a church, like to say, yes, Lord, come soon. Yes, yes. Uh, and I say that with, with, with hesitance because I have family, I have friends that don't know Jesus. And I want him to get here soon. I do. But at the same time, I want more time. More time to, to bring them in, to, to usher them in. 
In fact, Jesus even continues with that line of thought very soon here. Verse 10, he says, Since you kept my command to endure patiently, and that's exactly what some of you guys are doing, he says, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. i got to be honest, we don't know 100%, we, me and, and others, we don't know 100% what that exactly all entails. Uh, most scholars, um, and I agree with them, believe that it was something specific to the first century audience. Uh, it could have been war, it could have been famine, it could have been economic collapse, we don't know. There was something that was going to take place, and Jesus says, I've got you. Because you've been faithful, because you've been enduring, because you've been patient, I got your back, and you know what, whatever's going to happen, you're not going to have to go through that. Let me be clear, though, Jesus doesn't insulate us from things in this world, okay? Uh, there's a difference between being in His presence and not being in His presence. If you go through uh, some of this stuff, very briefly, and I wasn't going to include this because I didn't talk about this. If you go through and look at the scrolls, the trumpets, and the bowls through here, you might just walk away being confused or terrified or both. But let me just share with you, here's the basis from that. We will suffer through some things with the rest of the world because we are part of it, right? We are going to have, I'm sorry, Christians get in car accidents. Christians die from car accidents. Christians get cancer. Uh, Christians might, might die in floods or uh, tornadoes, um, earthquakes, those kinds of things. But those are going to happen. But listen, the point of all of those things in there is that you're going to go through things that are going to be difficult, but it's so much worse if you don't have Jesus. So patiently endure. Patiently endure. It doesn't mean he's going he's to take you from something and insulate you from the world because we are supposed to be in this world. That comes back to that separation that we talked about weeks and weeks ago. That we, we say, set apart. Oh, we need to be separated. And then we isolate ourselves. And that's not what we're supposed to do. So patiently endure. He gives that church the message they need to hear. Patiently endure. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Because guys, listen, we all have those, we all have moments every day where we can easily do that. Easily do that. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But continue on. Jesus says this. Probably the greatest news he could share with them. Starting in verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Starting in verse 12 now. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whew. Okay, there's a ton in there. <laughs> we could probably talk three sermons on that right there. We don't have that kind of time. I want to get through this as quickly as I can, but succinctly as well. There's a lot. Let's focus on the main aspect of it. Jesus says, I am coming soon. Now that was thousands of years ago, and some of you are sitting in here saying, yeah, what's, uh, what is soon? What does that mean? What, what's Jesus' definition of soon? I, I can tell you this. We can live one of two ways. Okay, We can live as if Jesus, really, we, live, we hear his words, read his words, we believe his words, and we live them. He is coming soon. And we live that way, that we believe he is really going to be returning in our lifetime. Or we can live over here just saying, well, he's coming soon, but I don't know what that means, and it's been thousands of years already, so I'm just going to do my thing. Let me just tell you, the churches in that day turned the world upside down. Acts chapter 17. I know I'm going a year ahead because next year is living out loud. We go through the entire book of Acts. But anyways, Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica, and there's a group of people that are opposing them, and, and this is what they say. This is their accusation against them, okay? Quote, unquote, these men have turned the world upside down. Whew, cool. Isn't that cool? I mean, it was an accusation, but actually it's a compliment. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, that's the, like the greatest compliment you could ever get. You turn the world upside down. They did so because they believed Jesus is coming soon. They really lived it. Let me give you an example. If you knew... Uh, just us, right here, just this room, something weird happened, I don't know, uh, uh, anyways, something strange happened, and we are the only ones who know that Jesus is returning in five hours. Like, guaranteed, without a doubt, stamp, stamp on it, right, you bet your life on it, five hours from now, Jesus is returning. You can't convince me, if, if you're truly sold out follower of Jesus, 
You can't convince me that your life walking out here would be exactly as it was yesterday or as it was last Sunday. You wouldn't go about, hopefully, won't go about your normal Sunday routine. Because if you know he's going to return in five hours, guys, there's some preparation that needs to take place. Right? I mean, if you can drive to somebody, you drive. But if not, you're picking up the phone, you're offering forgiveness, grace. You're going to individuals, whether it's, it's family members. Again, we talked about this. A spouse, children, parents. You're, you're imploring them to accept Jesus. You're going to your co-workers, your neighbors. You're, you're, again, you're imploring them. Receive Jesus. Not just, not just saying that, but you're sharing with them what Jesus looks like. And you need to know it because you need to exemplify that. It's not beating them on the head for the Bible. It's sharing with them what Jesus has done in your life. Has he transformed you? Really? Really? Is there real transformation in you? then that should show. It should be like a light that is so blinding that you can't miss it. That's what was going on with the early church. They was flipping the world upside down because they believed Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And that's what they would say. And that was how they lived. Are we living that way? I would just question that. I mean, are we known? Boy, those guys at Goshen Christian Church, man, they turn the world upside down. I don't know why I used that accent. But, <laughs> but is that us? I mean, are people... Well, those guys over there, man. I don't know, is that closer? That's even, it's probably even worse. Sorry. Yeah, I think my wife has family that talk like that. Anyways, um, are we known for that? Listen, when you go to work, do people know you're a Christian? And, and let me ask more specifically, do they know because you tell them? Or do they know because you show them? Are, are, you, are you just talking the talk or are you actually walking? Remember, I, I always say... I honestly, I, I think I'm the only person to ever say this. Might be my thing on my, on my tombstone. That our, our tongues in our mouths and our tongues in our shoes should always move in the same direction. What we say and what we do should never be different. They should always line up, especially when we're talking about Christianity, talking about anything that's faith-related, when we're leading others to Jesus. So first and foremost, he says, I'm coming soon. And you need to live like it. Because remember last week he says, look, here's the deal. If you don't repent, I'm coming like a thief in the night. Isn't, that, isn't it kind of interesting that Jesus consistently goes back and tells his church, you're doing a fantastic job, or you're not doing a great job. You need to repent, or I'm coming like a thief in the night. So we're either living like he's coming back any moment now. We better get going and do what we're supposed to do. Or, yeah, he might be coming back in any minute, but it's been thousands of years, and I'm just going to go have a turkey sandwich. Right? Because there's a difference in how we live. Now the rest of that, let me just briefly say, that he will make you a pillar in the temple of his God. That city would have, they would have resonated with that immediately. Uh, earthquakes, remember running rampant, violent earthquakes, destroying the city. Um, typically though, the pillars would stay standing. So from a visual perspective, they could even look around and be like, oh yeah, hey, I get it. Think about a pillar, though. You can see, like, like John. John is a pillar in the community. Right? I don't know that we'd say that. We should say that. We can say that. John's like, I don't know. I'm trying to get some feedback from him. He's just kind of like, oh, I'm not even going to respond to that one. But we say those things, right? Yeah, so-and-so. Bob is a pillar in the community. It's, it's strength. It's, it's you know, um, prominence. There's a permanence there. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, here's the deal. When you're victorious, you will be like a pillar. You will be in God's presence. You're not going to be shaken. You'll never be removed, ever. And I'm going to give you a new name. Now, we get a new body. Huh, amen to that. No more kidney stones. Woo, all right. But we also get a new name. And that is just super cool. Listen, the naming thing is, it, just, it's, it goes back to authority. You know? When your kids were born, you had the authority to name your child. You know, when you um, when you buy a, a, a super adorable little puppy, that should be here today. I have six for sure. When you buy a puppy, kitten, whatever. When you when you when you're a pet owner, you name you name that animal, whatever it is. Again, there's there's authority in that naming it. I'm not saying that more Jesus is pets. Don't hear me wrong. Okay? But he has authority to name us. And he gives us a new name. When we're victorious. So here's the deal. We have a chance to throw in the towel in every single moment going through the day. 
we have to be victorious. We need to overcome tons of things. Temptations, good Lord. They're everywhere you look. Remember 1 John? Oh my goodness. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. It's everywhere. You, you literally can't look somewhere in our society without seeing something visually or connecting emotionally with, with hey, I'm, you know, I deserve that, in that pride of life thing. It's all around us. We have, to, we have to defeat that every single day. Think about anger. Maybe anger in your own life. Anger in others. You know, there might be angry critics. Like, we don't have those, right? Nobody has an angry critic, right? Yeah, but we need to overcome those. We need to overcome friends who aren't so friendly, right? And guys, we need to overcome those things that are inside of us. Those ugly things that we don't want to come out. We don't want that to see the light of day. They're personal or private and we, we bury those. We don't want people to see those. We need to overcome those as well. And Jesus says, when you're victorious, I'm going to give you a new name. It can be God's presence. It's never going to end. Again, again, not written to us today, but written for us. And it's a message of, of comfort, hope, peace, strength. And then Jesus continues, verse 13, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Guys, do we have ears? Are we hearing? We, we would have heard the song this morning, but we didn't. There's a different song playing now. <laughs> Not exactly the same one. But we would have heard the song this morning in the bumper video, right? I'm listening. Speak to me. I want to hear you loud and clear. That, that's why I chose the, that particular song from Maddie Mullins to put in the video. Because it connects with what Jesus says to the churches. And every single letter he concludes with, if you have ears, listen up and pay attention. Do we want to hear? That's the real question. Do we want to hear? Are we listening? Message today. Hope. Comfort. Strength. Hopefully. Hopefully, that's what you got. And to those who are victorious, guys, that's the big kicker. Those who are victorious, boy, what a reward. What an amazing blessing. So let me just say this, guys. If you're here this morning, and this is like, this is, this is fun for me, but this is also not fun for me. 